Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 47, recorded November 2020. This is the Trek Profiles Podcast, where each episode we sit down with a Star Trek fan, we learn their Star Trek story, and we try to figure out why this show matters so much to them, to us, and to all of you. I'm John, your intrepid host of this whole enterprise, and I welcome you to this, the Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 47. If you wish to get in touch with us, you can reach us at feedback at trekprofiles.com or on the Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Warning, as we recorded this, we were in the middle of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, so all previous Trek content up to, and including that point, is fair game, and may be discussed during this episode. You have been warned, humans. As always, my trusty sidekick and co-host is the fully bionic, semi-laconic, but never ironic M5 Multitronic Unit. Say hello, M5. M5 available. All right, let's do the messages, M5. News displayed. The Trek Profiles Podcast is an independent show. If you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is to subscribe via your preferred podcasting platform. On episode 44, I had announced a contest where listeners like you could submit Kobayashi Maru lightning round questions for possible inclusion in the show. I actually got more results than I had expected, which was great. Now, given the long production timeline for some of my episodes, it'll be a while before you hear most of these questions, but I can tell you today that here are the winners. Abby Summer, that's at Abby M. Summer on the Twitter, sent in some great questions, and I have already used some of them on a recorded but as yet unreleased episode of the show, so you've got something to look forward to there. Listener Corby Hill at Right Bird Flies on Twitter also sent in questions, and I used some of those on episode 46 with Thad Hate. Ross Webster, host of the wonderful Snap Trek podcast, is also a winner for sending in a slate of questions that will be eventually appearing. And finally, we have Adam Sanders, who submitted a huge list of really excellent questions that also made the cut. So those will be appearing as well. Now, these four people submitted the best slates of questions from a ton of submissions, and they have all won cool Star Trek merch, which is on their way via the United Federation of Planets Postal Service. I want to thank everyone who submitted Kobayashi Maru questions, and I also wanted to tell you that even though the contest is over, I am making it a standard practice that I will continue to take your Kobayashi Maru questions for possible inclusion in the show. You can send in your questions anytime you want. And if I end up using it, I'll give you a shout out during the episode and I'll credit you on the show notes page as well. So tweet me, email me and see if you can challenge my upcoming guests with your questions. Speaking of the Kobayashi Maru, let's do the feedback from episode 44 with Noah Everback Katz. Who's fixing your warp drive, Trip Tucker or Balana Torres? Noah went with Florida Man and selected Trip, but the online poll people preferred Torres by 66 to 34 percent. What kind of agent are you? Temporal Investigations or Section 31? Temporal Time Travel Agents was the choice of both my guest and the Twitter people by 81 to 19%. Next, Darmok and Jalad on the ocean or Sokath, his eyes uncovered. Both Noah and the Twitter people had the sudden understanding that Sokath was the right answer by 57 to 43%. Who had the worst parenting, Annika Hansen or Julian Bashir? Again, everyone selected the correct answer by picking the Hansons, who were about as dumb as a box of rocks, by 73 to 27%. Choose your vacation spot, Free Cloud or Argelius 2. You'll find everyone hanging out on Free Cloud at Bajazel's place, where everyone knows your name and is glad you came. The final score was 71 to 29, and Noah picked that as well. And as always, check my Twitter after this episode drops, and you will be able to have your say on this episode's questions. And don't forget, you can always send me your Kobayashi Maru questions as well. There are some lightly edited outtakes and bonus material at the end of this episode. They'll come after the ending audio cards. Enjoy them, or not, as you choose. As I mentioned before, this is episode 47, a particularly auspicious number in Trekland. I didn't have anything special planned, but I just thought I might point that out and uh, let y'all enjoy that. Okay, enough of this. Let's get it started. M5, roll it. <laughs> 
M5 is processing. Her favorite character is Captain Kirk, but she also finds Scotty very interesting and logical. Her favorite ship is the Enterprise Refit. She's from Michigan, North America, Earth in Sector 001. It's author Diane Carey. Welcome, Diane, and thanks for being on the podcast. Hi, I'm glad to be here, even though I'm sitting here comfortably in my great room. I, I know. I technology. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, technology, let me tell you. Uh, Diane. Although are, I do miss going to the cons and seeing people. This COVID thing has shut everybody down. I feel very isolated. I, I know. And so it's it, it, the one bright side for me is that it's given me more time a little bit to work on my podcast to sort of do the fan stuff uh, that I do and, and reach out to talk to fans that I normally wouldn't have the ability to talk to if they weren't going to conventions and all of that. So I find that a plus. Well, that's good. That's good. Diane, are you a Star Trek fan? Well, I would have to be, wouldn't I? <laughs> I started, I, uh, I, I, yes, I, I am a Star Trek fan. I started out as a Star Trek fan at my dad's side. He was a Marine veteran, and uh, yeah, I was 16, I think, and he was watching Star Trek, and I ended up watching it with him because we used to watch all that stuff together. I was very military-oriented uh, as a kid. I still am. And we would watch combat and the Rat Patrol and the Hogan Heroes and, you know, everything war oriented, bridge to the bridge too far, the bridge over the river Kwai, and everything that would show up on our TVs. We would watch it together. And Star Trek was one of those. It was a submarine picture, really. And so we would watch that, too, because it had the same command structure and the things that we recognized from our military entertainment. So if you were watching it with your dad, and I assume you're talking about the original series with Kirk and Spock and all of that. Um, That's right. When, when you were watching the original series, when did you realize that you were more of a, that, that you actually became something called a Star Trek fan as opposed to someone who just watched the show? Well, I discovered that a bunch of my friends also were Star Trek fans. And then there turned out to be a, a Star Con, one of the first cons. Uh, was down in the Detroit area, and a bunch of friends and I bundled up and drove down there together. And we went to the Star Con. And in, in those days, all the actors showed up at one con. It, and it, it gradually stopped doing that, and they would focus on one person who would come as a guest of the con. But in those days, uh, everybody was there. I think Shatner was there. I know um, uh, George Decay was there, and Walter Koenig was there, and... Um, there were a whole bunch of a uh, whole bunch of the, the the actors there, so we went down there and enjoyed that convention in, in the Detroit uh, Cobo Hall. And I just never I never got the joke. I stayed with uh -huh. Star Trek forever after that. And what happened to me was um, I was a published author at some point. I was published at 25 years old, and I so, published hold about on. six. Let, let me ask you one question first, which is uh, uh, roughly what year was that that you went to that convention? Oh, that would have been about 70, one, two, three, high school, college, about 74, I think, 76. Oh, fantastic. I graduated, I graduated in 76, so probably was about 74. Okay, wonderful. And so you were a published author in your mid-20s? Yes, I became published, and I was writing books. And one of my friends, who also was a Star Trek fan, said, you know, there's a line of books. And I said, there is. Because I just, you know, uh, the funny part is I was a reader when I was a kid and then I became an author and I kind of stopped reading because all I was doing was writing. So I didn't <laughs> keep up on things. It's one of the problems. You're, you're writing all the time. The last thing you want to do when you're not writing is then read. Mm -hmm. So I kind of stopped reading and this friend of mine said, there's a line of Star Trek books. And I said, oh, is that right? And I sent in. I sent in a proposal to uh, an editor named Mimi Panich, who was at, at, uh, at the time, I think it had just went from Bantam to Pocket. Okay. And so I sent a, uh, the way you send in a book proposal is three chapters and an outline. So I did that and I didn't hear anything. And after a few weeks, um, me being myself, I just picked up the phone and called her. Uh, <laughs> and she, <laughs> she answered that she, I said, I sent in a proposal and she said, Oh, I know who you are. You've broken every rule we have, and we love it. Now, what I, rules was I, she referring to? I, I need to know this. She was, well, the, the rules were, first of all, no first person, and I wrote the book in first person. 
no characters telling the story who were not the main core characters, and I broke that rule. Um, the reason I broke it was I figured we'd already heard Kirk's point of view from every direction, and we needed to look at our characters from somebody else's point of view. So I invented a new character named Piper, and she had to deal with Kirk and Spock and the other one. The trick was Kirk and Spock and, and the main characters still had to remain the heroes of the story. And that was the key, because there were lots of what were called Mary Sue's or Mary Jane's, where Ensign Wonderful pops in from nowhere and wins the day. Well, that's not allowed, and it's a bad idea. So Kirk and Spock and everybody stayed one step ahead of her all the way, and which added a, an element of comedy, which they also had never had in the book, so they were funny. Oh, well, Star and Trek has a... Star Trek has a long history of, of comedy. I, I think it's actually been an underrated element of the franchise, I think. I do, too. But most people hadn't noticed it at that time. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, it was just something that was fresh. And it jumped off the shelves. Everybody was surprised. It went to the New York Times bestseller list, top 10. And nobody was more shocked than I. And you're referring, it of course, the to the book Dreadnought. Dreadnought. It was the first. Star Trek New York Times bestseller, at least in the top 10. I don't know if, if any one of them was, you know, top 69 or something, but it went right to the top of the list there. So I, I, have, to, the I have to ask one question about this, which is uh, it's been reported on the Internet. And, you know, so I, I always take everything I read on the Internet with a grain of salt. Uh, was the cover art actually based on you and your partner at the time? That's my husband, Greg Roeder. And, and so that and is me, you? Uh, a really nice skinny version of me. Well, what happened was Boris Vallejo was doing the covers at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had Piper's jumpsuit in my closet. So I put it on and I sent him a picture so that he could have a photo reference. And he called and said, why don't you come out to New York and I'll take a, a professional photo of you and I'll put you on the cover. And I said, all right, okay, what? And so we did that. And when uh, my husband walked in the door, uh, Boris said, oh, the male character. So we went down into the studio in his basement where he had a professional photo studio, and he took the pictures of us, and there we were on the cover. The Vulcan Country Mouse Sarda character, correct? That's the one, yeah. Amazing. Well, I can't let that go by because I have to ask, how do, how do you have Piper's jumpsuit in your closet? I mean, how did that come to be? Because I was wearing it. It was my favorite jumpsuit. It was my favorite suit. I like to travel in it. And I just put her in it because um, it wasn't a Star Trek uniform. I wanted her to look different and be different. So she's in this outfit, and I figured, all right, I'll just use the one I have. Oh, I see. So it was something and, you had that you decided that that's what the character would be wearing. That's it. Got it. Got it. So, uh, okay. Authors, authors are like that. We Authors use our, you know, our favorite jewelry, our favorite clothes, our dogs, whatever. Not this dog. Not you, buddy. <laughs> but, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Authors can be like that. We trowel uh, our lives into our books in little ways. All right. So you had published. So you published Dreadnought. It was a huge success. What happened next? Well, they asked me to do another one right away, and I said, "Oh yeah." And so I did. I wrote. I wrote Dreadnought in eight weeks, and Battle Stations in twelve weeks. And Battle Stations was, uh, I think, top. 11 on the New York Times bestseller list. Anyway, it was a bestseller too. So those two came right in tandem. And then they asked me to do something called a giant novel. And we've never done this before. Pocket had never done it. But Star Trek, after my two books, yeah, I'm kind of taking credit for it, got attention. Nobody had, ever, none of them had ever been on the New York Times list before. So all of a sudden, Paramount Studios and Pocket Books realized there was money in this. There was a future. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with it. I don't have any problem with I don't have any problem with the profit motive. It's okay with me. I'm a capitalist. And um, and it's a healthy system, so it works. Um, but they asked me if I right away could do something. They want to do something called a giant novel, which is about twice as big as their usual novel. So and they, they kept asking me the new things like, uh, OK, can you can you um, write a book about the launch of the first enterprise? So sure, no problem. OK, call me back a couple of days later. Can you get Robert April into this? Well, who the hell's Robert April? <laughs> of, course, 
I have who, you know, and in Trek lore, this is the first captain of the Enterprise who hadn't showed up at the time. It was just something that was written into the being developed as as kind of a fan lore sort of thing and something that was an original concept when they were developing the series, which took a tremendous amount of gobbledygook. And Robert April was just one of the names that they bandied about as the name of the first, you know, captain. So here's Robert April. I had to invent the guy. Mm-hmm. So I did. And uh, he showed up later. But anyway, I invented this guy. And nice guy, nice captain. Not the ideal captain for the, for the Enterprise, but a developer of the program. And then they called me back a few days later. Can you get George Kirk into it? And I'm like, who the hell is George Kirk? What are you <laughs> What are you doing to me? Are you inventing these people? Turns out George Kirk, you know, George Samuel Kirk was Kirk's brother. He died in the series. Mm -hmm. George Kirk, apparently, his father. I'm like, oh, fine. You know, because everybody expects you to do George Kirk for him to just be another James Kirk. Well, I couldn't do that. So George Kirk was a kind of a stern, loose cannon, and he and Robert April together are the two parts of the, the James Kirk who became the captain of the Enterprise, kind of like my favorite episode, The Enemy Within, that splits the two, mm-hmm. uh, splits the person into the two entities that make up the perfect commanding universe person. So Robert April and George Kirk got together, and they were the main characters in, uh, in Final Frontier. Worked out. And you've been writing novels of various kinds ever since. Oh, yeah. Well, like I said, I wrote like four or six books. I can't remember before that on various subjects. And um, my, I, found my, I found my niche in Star Trek. I'm very, very good at it. One of the reasons I'm good at it is I actually sail real sailing ships. So I work as a watch officer aboard these ships, and I have real captains and real ships and real officers, and I deal with that thing in a in a day-to-day basis in my real life. So it's interesting you bring that up because often on the podcast, I've talked about the fact that I was in the Navy and I worked in the nuclear reactor plant on a fast attack submarine. And so I was on, a, uh, I was on a nuclear sub, I think it was called the Greenway. Greenway? Greenway. Somebody, one of my fans invited us aboard. Her husband was an officer aboard that ship. So we mar- we mar- actually were aboard a nuclear sub before the, you know, COVID thing shut everything down. Oh, ago. yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, one of the... Th- Matter of fact, the funny story was I had just adopted my little son. He was, it was 26 years now, but he was a, a baby. He was a little baby. We just got him from Guatemala. Uh-huh. And then we went we went on this nuclear submarine. So we're out on the flat top of the submarine and we were going to go below through the, you know, big round tube that you go down to get in the sub. Correct. With a straight up and with a straight up and down ladder. You know this ladder has no yeah, plant to it at all. It's two stories tall. And straight up and down ladders are really very hard to climb. So I looked down this hole, right? And I I couldn't carry the baby down. So this burly sailor pops out of this hole, grabs my baby, and disappears down the hole. And now I'm going, oh great, now I gotta go down there. And <laughs> <took> my baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my little son. I gotta go now, you know, because I'm looking at this this ladder going. I ain't going down there. But I had to go because he took my child. So I yeah. went down and we toured the we it's, toured the submarine. That that's my advice for anybody who's going to take a tour of a submarine. Is first of all, uh, always wear sturdy shoes, and if you're a lady, resist the urge to wear a dress. <laughs> well, I didn't have a dress on for sure because my ship was like docked right next door. Oh, that's glorious. So you don't wear you know you don't you don't wear skirts on uh, to be on our ships, but that wasn't the problem. The guy and my baby. <laughs> hey, where are you? You know. And I looked down this tube, and, and he was already gone. So I had to go get the baby. The the part of this that always holds me up a little bit is that whenever I see things in a show, and it could be Star Trek, it could be anything else, that takes place on a ship, and there's something that happens that that I know just isn't how things would actually happen it takes me out of it. And I think, Ooh, that was a bad call. Like, that's not how that would work. Or that's not what that oh. does, you know? And it sucks it made, me out of it, it all the time. Me, well, it sucked me out of it during, I can't remember which one of the movies with uh, Chris Pine, his crew was bossing him around. They just kept telling him what was going to happen. Um, Zoe Zeldana and, um, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, oh boy, one of my fav favorite actors. Um, I can't remember his name Zach right now. Zachary Quinto. Bit, you know, Scotty. No, Scotty. What was his name? Oh, uh, Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg. Um, yes. They're telling Kirk what's going to happen. You know. Excuse me, Captain, but this is what's happening now. And I just it, it made me nuts because I could tell that the writers didn't have any ship protocol experience. Yeah, you can usually tell that. And sometimes in Star Trek, it's very clear that, that whoever's writing an episode doesn't have uh, certain kinds of life experiences. Uh, the, the one example that always jumps out at me is this infamous scene in The Next Generation where uh, Chief O'Brien and Keiko O'Brien are newly married and they're having breakfast. And they're having the most bizarre conversation that no married couple in the history of the universe would ever have. And I, as, okay. as, I, as I watch this episode, I think to myself, whoever wrote this has not been in a serious relationship, much less married, because married people do not – this is not what happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can absolutely tell when people are writing something with which they have no experience. You can tell. Yeah. Now, the funny part about that is that really I work on, I work on things about which I have no experience all the time. I've never been to space. Mm -hmm. So I actually have to research that. And, and work on it, really work on it, work at, at the visuals, work at the, the, the physical realities and all of that. So it, takes a, a, it, takes a, it takes a pretty humble writer to understand what you don't know and that you need to find out things before you just start slapping it down on the page. Right. So that's what I do. I do a, tr I do a tremendous amount of preparation. I work on uh, five by eight note cards with my thesaurus next to me. And I and my husband in front of me because he's the plot man, he's the developer. And together we cobble together something that makes sense. And then everything goes through him. He reads everything that I have ever written and tells me when I am not hitting the mark. And he's very good at that. He's um and I take it. You you gotta be able to take it. If you can't take criticism, you're not gonna be a very good writer. Yeah, anything you do in the creative arts, you have to be able to to get the feedback and be able to act on it. Otherwise, you're you're going to be in for a hard time for sure. Too many people, too many people write in their own blood, which is a phrase we have for just not being not being willing to to change anything. You just can't stay open. So, Diane, as we sit here in 2020, there is probably around 800 or, and 800 hours of canonical Star Trek that's been produced. Have you seen all of it? I have, have I seen all of it? I have seen most of it. I think I've missed uh, some Deep Space Nine, and I might have missed some Voyager, but generally I've seen pretty much all of it. Have you watched any I of the new shows? No, I don't watch the new shows. Okay, so Discovery, I'm not, the Picard I'm not, show? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not drawn in by those. Okay. I mean, to be to be fair, I haven't watched them, so I can't comment on them. No, it's not um, worried. It's just that it's not uh, it's not what I want to watch. It's not what my husband wants to watch anymore with his few hours not working. Um, so I I just have not gotten into the role of watching, you know, what I do for a living all the time. <laughs> I like to watch Don Knotts movies and Dick Van Dyke. I'm kind of an old fashioned girl. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. So in your Although we do like uh, we do like Brim. And um, Justified was a very good show until, for some reason, it just out of the blue stopped. We watched uh, Gotham. Can't quite figure that one out. Waiting for something to happen. You know, <laughs> waiting I, for Batman to show I, up. I, I really enjoyed. Uh, I really enjoyed Justified too. It, it was really something else, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> it's like they, and I get frustrated because you can tell at which point they they just don't know what to do. They they don't know how to go forward. Because you got to sit down and have that meeting, and a lot of people don't. Right. You've got to sit down with your husband or your creative team or whatever and say, what are we doing next, and why are we doing it? That's the most important part. What you do is fine, but you need to know why. Why are we doing what we're doing? What is the reader going to see or viewer going to see that he, she hasn't seen before? What are we going to do that's compelling? And what kind of dramatic vice can we put these characters in to drag the humanity out of them? It's That's definitely sounds like the approach to take, right? Because you're being deliberate in what you're doing rather than just kind of stumbling around with what seems like a good idea at the time. And I don't believe in stumbling. <laughs> 
I have to know. You've got to know. I've got to know where I'm going as far as the the story is concerned. I don't just um, you know wait for. There is no waiting for inspiration. That's just stupid. So I have to ask, you had made a reference to the fact that you attended a convention in the 70s in your capacity as a fan. Uh, Did you continue to do conventions either in your capacity as an author doing an appearance or just as a fan? Oh, I'll pretty much appear anywhere anybody wants me to. I love public speaking. And I love talking to the fans. Anytime anybody asks me to go do something, I pretty much go as long as my expenses are covered. And what do you, what is that uh, what is that experience like for you as someone who was a Star Trek fan and is now sort of involved inside the Star Trek universe? Well, it's very sweet. People are unfailingly nice, and they treat me great. And um, I have not ever had a bad experience at a convention or with a group of fans in any way. Usually, it's just a lot of fun. They ask me questions, and I tell them. Honestly, what uh, what I as, answer as well as I can and as much as I know. I try not to speculate, but we have a real good time. I enjoy it very much. Have you amassed a collection of anything Star Trek related? Um, not a lot. I do have a couple of beautiful models. One of my one of my fans turned out to be a very very good friend. Sent me a huge model of the the Enterprise, and it was the refit Enterprise and. I just put the darn thing together eventually. And the funny part was I, I had, I handed to my son and said, here, you put this together. You, you're the engineer. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't figure it out. And I took it into my, my great, my, my family room in there. And I put it together in a matter of days. Why? Because I know the ship so well. It was kind of funny. <laughs> I actually know the ship. I know where this goes. I know where that goes. I know where this goes. I understand this. And I just put it together. It's in my office now. It's really big. It's very pretty. You can make a chandelier out of this thing. I mean, it's huge. How, how big is huge, would you say? Oh, it's about um, I about 25 inches long. Oh, my goodness. That is pretty big. Yeah, it's pretty big and very pretty. I love it. I love the ship. Oh, yeah, I, me I have too. A, I have, a, I have a, almost a three-foot model of uh, the Alexandria, one of the schooners that I sailed and worked on for many years, is in my office, too. Oh, I think there's a picture of that up on your website. Yeah, well, that ship is in my office. I had an engineer friend, elderly man, who loved to put together models. And I'm telling you, it is spectacular. He measured my hand because the ship was gone. She sank. He measured my hand and then extrapolated the sizes of everything from photographs of me and my little hand on on a bucket and stuff like this. It was a, it was a, a wonderful work of engineering and I cherish it. I'll put it in a museum someday. So you have your big <laughs> enterprise model. Do you have anything else that's notable in your Star Trek collection? Oh yes. I have a communicator that actually works. It keys into a cell phone, also a gift. Um, I have another model of um, the, one of the enterprise permutations that's smaller, but uh, very pretty. Um, what else do I have? I have a 50th anniversary Star Trek mug, coffee mug. You know, there, there, I have a Tribble. Do, do you drink out of the mug or is it just uh, for looking at? Well, I only look at it. It's in my office on top of the, of the, uh, of the schooner. But you can drink out of it. It's perfectly fine. Um, but uh, my Tribble is in my motor home. He travels with me. <laughs> oh, oh, fantastic. <laughs> you got to have a Tribble. My Tribble... Is one of the original tribbles from like a con forty some years ago. Oh right, my tribble is not a new, he's not a new tribble. He's been around a while. He and, used and, to chirp, but that stopped a long time ago. And he's still in pretty good shape, though. Oh yeah, he's in good shape. He still has all his hair. Oh, that's fantastic. That's glorious. Well, congratulations. If you want to send me pictures of any of that, I'll I'll happily post it on the show notes page up at Trek Profiles. But that's up to you. Oh yeah, I can uh, I can do that. I'll have to get some person who knows what he's doing to transfer all the pictures to my phone, but I can do that. I mean, from my phone, but I can send you pictures. Oh, I'd I'd love that. I'd love that. Well, Diane, okay. I think we should talk about some Star Trek episodes. What do you say? Go for it. So you made reference earlier to one of your favorite episodes, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Uh, The Enemy Within, Star Trek: The Original Series, Season One, Episode Four. This is the one where. Uh, transporter accident separates Kirk into his two different halves and we sort of have to see what happens in the episode and how we resolve this and sort of we examine Kirk a little bit psychologically here and you'd made reference to the fact that 
as a writer, it really interested you because it was really a character study about Jim Kirk. So tell me more about that. Well, it's a character study about the nature of command is what it is, uh, which is what James Kirk is. If you talk about an archetype, he is an archetypal Navy commander or ship's commander. And you split him in two and you discover that the strength of his character is in the part that has no morals. Interesting. You know, and and the gentle character is not of much good other than maybe he could become a priest. But together they temper each other and they and they and they amalgamate into a strength that also has morals. It seems like the dark side is essentially necessary and is tempered by that other side to sort of have that command presence. Yes, he has to have an element of ruthlessness, but it has to be not exactly restrained, but it has to be guided by wisdom. And that episode really did a good job as a literary piece in using the character of James Kirk as a, as a main character to do that sort of thing. I mean, that's what all main characters should do. They should be there to examine the nature of their situation and the individual. You know, the same type of thing in something like The Man of La Mancha or Richard Chamberlain, the... Um, Count of Monte Cristo, mm -hmm. you know, morphs into something completely different than he was at the beginning and discovers a, a, a ruthlessness that has to be there for his measure of revenge. And then he can never quite dial back. That's why literary characters in, or stay with us and, and give us something to talk about in, you know, college classes from now until ad nauseum. Which is why I don't like Hamlet. I think Hamlet is a flat schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I, I don't bother with Hamlet. I think it's, uh, it's it's one of the dumbest characters ever popped up by Shakespeare. But he, he really does dither quite a bit. He's he's not particularly decisive uh, or goal oriented in any real way. Yeah, well, that's the problem with Hamlet. You know, make up your mind, you idiot. <laughs> uh, the real the, the real the real question in something like Hamlet is not. My father, did he do it or did, did he not do it? The real question is, is Hamlet insane? Is he seeing the ghost or is he not seeing the ghost? Is it in his head? Is this real or not real? And what, what does it drive him to? In other words, what do, our, what do our imaginings and the privacy of our mind drive us to do in our lives? I mean, th this is how you look at literature and how you look at James Kirk and, and these other characters. People have tried to do you know let's be real fascinated by spock but spock is a direct guy um he his being half human that was the silly part about star trek well i feel my half human part pulling at me well i'm half assyrian but i'm not driven to go to the desert once in a while you know <laughs> um, it, it's it's that kind of thing is just ridiculous we're not half something and half something that that was quirky trick of the, of the of the 60s that got pushed into the character of Spock. That's not why he's interesting. He's interesting because he just didn't feel comfortable anywhere and joined Starfleet instead of going into the Vulcan Science Academy because he wanted more. One of the things I think is interesting about The Enemy Within is that in a television show, you have a very tight time limit that you're trying to hit. And you have to have a certain amount of action beats and a certain number of things in every episode, whether you want to or not. And you often don't get to have a leisurely moment to examine the interior lives of the characters sort of in their heads, which as an author, you have a little bit more leeway to, to do that within the pages of a book. So in a way, this episode gives you sort of that literary ability to sort of see the inside of Jim Kirk's mind that you don't normally get in an episode in a lot of ways. But I'm curious for you as an author, you as a Star Trek author, you had the ability to get in there and actually talk about what Scotty is thinking and, you know, how Chekhov feels about something or what Captain Kirk, uh, what his interior monologue is as he's thinking about things. And that's, uh, I think, truly amazing. Um, I'm wondering how you were able to tackle that, uh, considering that it's, you know, you were writing very early on before we, you didn't, you, we didn't have much besides the, the show itself just on TV. So how did you approach that as far as the interior lives of the characters? 
Well, when I started with that, I told you I started with a character who was not one of the main characters, and she had to look at them and try to figure out what they were thinking and how the situation was affecting them and how she should respond. And if she could help by maybe going over here and doing something else or, you know, what should be her plan of action. So it was interesting to look at these characters from somebody else's point of view. And it is very difficult to look at them from their own points of view because they know their own mind. And it still, you, you, it, it's very difficult and it's very tricky to take a character like James Kirk and showcase his doubts, which is what drama is. I mean, he's just totally sure of himself and there's no problem, big deal. I mean, Spider-Man has to have doubts. And even Batman, lots of hesitation. I'm, I'm, Batman's only human. Everything that he did came from his own mind and his own technology. So these characters, you know, the more complex, the better. I'm sure Stan Lee, when he invented Superman and Batman, never imagined the psychological depths to which those characters would be taken. So it's always nice to be able to take the characters and the actors and say, what is he really thinking at this point? And then be able to try to write it down. But, you know, you better be right, um, which is the hard part. Do I have the same perceptions as the other million people who are watching this? And what can I tell them? You know, for instance, the, the Horta was a very interesting character. And James Kirk totally changed when he found out it was a female. Totally changed. Every time James Kirk figured out that something was a female, like the companion, everything changed. Because why? Because James Kirk loves females. It's not that he wants to jump and hump every woman that comes by. That's not the case. He didn't do that. He loves and respects women. It's different from being a hound. And unfortunately, he, he has come off in the movies as just a rah, 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 sort of a hound. Just, you know, hey, let me, look at your, let me look at your body with your underwear. But that's not James Kirk. James Kirk respected all females. And that was the core of his character that is often missed. So you had made reference to the fact that in The Enemy Within, we got to examine sort of the different sides of Kirk. I think we also saw an echo of that in one of the TNG episodes. I'm thinking of Attached, uh, which if you may not remember it, it's the one where uh, Captain Picard and the Doctor, uh, Bev Crusher, are on this planet and they're, they're mentally linked and they start to feel each other's thoughts. And at one point, they're, they're walking along the planet, and she says, which way should we go? And he says, we should go this way. And because she can now read his mind, she says, you don't have any idea which way we should go. Do you do, do, you're just making that up and sounding like you know what you're talking about. Do you do that all the time? <laughs> yeah. And it was Good really observation. Sometimes let's just, hey, let's just do this, and we'll take some action, and we'll see what happens, and then we'll deal with that. And that's true. It's, it's exactly that sort of thing. You don't really know what you're talking about, do you? No, but I'm going to try it anyway. You're going to follow me. That's right. I mean, that's uh, pretty good. That's pretty good. One of the one of the things uh, I'll I'll give you an example of something that bothered me that you shouldn't do. This is an example of what I would never have let them do if I were writing for the show. Uh, you have the Borg, which which unfortunately is a lousy enemy because they're just machines, but that's what they like. So they had the Borg. And they got to a point where the Borg were vulnerable. And who beat the Borg? Was it Picard? These were his lifetime enemies? No, it was the doctor who beat the Borg. Uh, you should not ever do that. Let Picard beat his own enemy. So you feel like he was robbed in a way. He was robbed. The character was robbed of his destiny, his literary destiny. I don't believe in destiny, but... What should have happened to him was taken away from him and given to the doctor because somebody somewhere said, wouldn't it be cool if the doctor beat the Borg? Well, someone else in the office should have said, no, you don't do that. Your main character has to beat his own enemy or, or, you, or you've lost the direction that you're supposed to be in. You know, this is like somebody other than Bat, Batman beats the Joker. It's just, that's not how that's not how you do a good strong literary story. 
You made a reference to The Devil in the Dark and talking about how James Kirk, if I can put a word on it, had sort of the chivalrous attitude uh, towards women and how he really had a big change in his perspective uh, regarding the, the Horda once he'd found out about that. And boy, I'll tell you, you know, when you go back and you look at the episode, he, he really was pretty hardcore uh, on that. And in fact, there's even a, a moment where he calls out Spock, like in front of all the crew. And he says, we're not going to be negotiating or capturing. We're going to kill it. You know, and I, I just thought, whoa, hey, I barely re- had remembered that. And then when I was rewatching the episode, it really struck me as uh, really quite a moment for the captain to speak to Spock in that way in front of everybody, you know, and it wasn't in private. So that was a, that was certainly a moment that jumped out at me. It did. And then later what happened? He said the first man that kills it is dead. The first man that shoots is dead. He was willing to kill to protect her because he discovered that she was intelligent, she was a mother, she had motivation, and she was right. She was protecting her children. He was willing to kill to protect her. He changed completely. It was really an excellent episode in that because he did what main characters are supposed to do, which is have an arc, a character arc. Absolutely. And it was very satisfying in the end. And certainly an episode that, that, to borrow a phrase, stands the test of time. I mean, I have had numerous guests on the show who want to talk about it. I think it's a great thing that, you know, here's an episode from a show from 50 years ago that still touches people, right? Because the things that it's about are timeless and actually count, you know, it's it's important and uh, it still touches people. And I think that's one of my favorite things about Star Trek. And yet it's set in the future. And the futuristic element is that this this thing that looks to us like a monstrous piece of rock is intelligent and has life and has the right to exist. And I always thought that in the end, Commander Lurie should have had one of those little baby tribbles sitting on his, or baby, uh, not tribble, but a little baby horta sitting on his desk moving around. I missed that opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) I think that would have been glorious. Yeah, I'd love to have me a little tiny horta sitting on my desk. Well, I think there's an opportunity for anyone out there that's making uh, Star Trek toys, make a baby Horda. It'll sell like hotcakes. Of that, I uh, I guarantee it. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> An- another episode that uh, is on the list that the M5 told me we should talk about is uh, the two fur of Space Seed and the Wrath of Khan. So it seems like you're quite taken with the Khan character, Diane. Uh, it, uh, Kirk's maybe greatest nemesis. I'll be curious to see if you agree with that assertion or not. I do agree with that. And so much of it, of course, had to do with just the raw power of Ricardo Montalban. His performance was certainly set at at 10. I mean, there was nowhere to go beyond that, right? He was right up to the limit of what he could do in the show. And he brought such power that, you know, because the thing about villains, right, is they always have to match the hero. If the villains are stupid then it doesn't make your heroes look all that great for having defeated them, which in a way is one of the reasons I always thought the Ferengi were preposterous in Next Generation because they were so goofy that it just didn't... Well, you know, that was a stupid decision because they were were making this point about how we're all socialists now, so we hate capitalists, so here are the bad capitalists with the snaggly teeth and all they think about is profit. Well, that doesn't make a very good nemesis because they don't think. They just are. And and they're not individuals. And non-individuals are not good nemeses. Your nemesis should be an individual, not a whole race. What do you feel is the key element in Space Seed that makes it so good? Oh, the fact that both Kirk and Khan were right from their own points of view. Khan was trying to save his people. Kirk was trying to save his people. And if you take either side, you can understand the motivation and see what they were up against. You have a, um, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's not a matter of right versus wrong or good versus evil. Those are easy. I mean, that's a cinch. Well, the problem is when you have a right versus a right and they clash in their goals and their means, that's when you get drama. Well, I think Khan had a very different point of view in Wrath of Khan. It wasn't really about trying to save people. It was much more about revenge. Well, he thought that was right. See, (laughs) he believed that that was of value and it needed to happen. And he was very bitter with the fact that he, he and his people paid such a price and James Kirk never had. So for him, it was right. It was a balance in the universe that was off kilter. 
So that was his motivation, and he thought it was right to do. I didn't say they, that your character necessarily needs to actually be right. The character needs to believe he is right. So what is your opinion then on the Benedict Cumberbatch version of Khan in Star Trek Into Darkness? I thought he was miscast. Um, I think he was cast because he was popular at the time because of Sherlock. They obviously didn't try to replicate the character as we've known it. They just brought in Benedict Cumberbatch and said, hey, let's make him con. I think it was probably probably a bad idea. It certainly was a surprise. And I think the movie actually could have been just as good if they had just left him as John Harrison, um, which I think is the fictional yeah. name that he starts with in the in the movie. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, if they had just let him be another nemesis, sure. Um, but as Khan, I never bought it. They didn't really try that hard to make him. I mean, they made Zachary Quinto look like Leonard Nimoy. They didn't bother to do anything at all with Cumberbatch. They just cast him and stuck him there and said, here, read these lines. And, you know, I don't think it suited him very well. Diane, it's the year 2020, and I'm looking here uh, on Memory Alpha, and it's reminding me that your first Star Trek book was published in 1986. So that's, let's see, 20, 34 years ago as we record this, uh, give or take. Oh, my goodness. So Star Time Trek... Flies. Time flies, flies. <laughs> <laughs> so Star Trek has been a big part of your life uh, for 34 years, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, can you tell me why Star Trek matters to you? Why it's been such a part of your life for all this time? Well, for one thing, I was able to pay a lot of bills and have my babies and buy my homes and, and have a career. And that alone is important to me. I mean, that your career is important to you. Every way that we manage to survive and, and have a job is important to each of us because your life is, doesn't add up to much if you don't have some kind of a reason to get up in the morning. Even if you go be a grocery clerk, it's a value. It's a, it's a, it, there is no such thing as a, a dead-end job. All jobs are good jobs because they move the world forward. And uh, even if you're checking out things at uh, 7-Eleven, you're moving the world forward. You're helping people get along with their lives. So my being able to write for a living, as rare as that is in this world without becoming Tom Clancy, is very special to me because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not J.K. Rowling. I didn't, I didn't hit the, the glorious money pot, but I did do well enough to raise my kids and have a home and um, allow my husband and me to work, uh, work without other jobs for over 15 years, which was great because we could raise our kids and be together and travel. And that, uh, that was important to us. It enhanced our lives greatly. And it was also Lots and lots of fun. Not that there weren't tremendous frustrations in trying to work with the licensing at Paramount and editors and all of the restrictions that come with being a published author, because there are plenty. But it was a challenging career to have to sit across the table from my husband and say, what the heck are we going to do this time that people are going to be interested in reading and that's going to enhance their lives? So it was a, it was a great challenge. And then the physical challenge of just trying to turn out 300 pages within a deadline is itself its own little pot of horrors, but we don't have to get into that. <laughs> I'm sure you get that <laughs> because there are, there are deadlines. It's not a matter of just sitting, sitting around and waiting for inspiration to strike. And I think I'll write this today and I'll write three pages tomorrow and I'll write nothing the next day. Every day I had to turn out pages and I had a deadline looming. And so we had to we had to whip inspiration into shape. We had to call upon inspiration when we needed it, not when it struck. Um, there's a tremendous amount of discipline in that, and uh, and that's what to me is the difference between a professional and someone who is just a casual writer, an amateur writer. The the discipline of being able to produce. You bet, and, and produce something worth publishing. <laughs> I mean, it has to be it, because. No, I'm serious. It has to be good. It has to be good enough. And I'll give an example. Um, we finished a book, and then we um, we finished a, a version of the Great Starship Race, and it wasn't that good. And our editor sent us a, a, a letter describing what was sort of the failing of this book, and 
And then we have an editor conversation over the phone and we talk about how we can fix this and fix that and fix this. And he called to talk about it. And I said, what's to talk about? When you're right, you're right. We'll rewrite it. And there was this dead silence on the other end of the line. And then he said, I have never had an author phone call like this. And I said, well, you're right. The book is crap. We'll rewrite it. And we did. We took the entire month of May. We were going to take it off because <laughs> we were looking forward to not working. And instead, we <laughs> took the entire month of May and totally rewrote the book. And it turned out to be one of our best books. Why? Because we were willing to say, yeah, he's right. It's crap. And we redid it. And it turned out to be terrific. So, you know, uh, fighting and scrapping and defending your work that isn't good enough doesn't get you anywhere. So this is one of the, this is the difference between a professional and just somebody who writes because he wants to see his own words down. And it's very, very hard. It is definitely harder to be a professional than it is to just be an amateur writer doing it for yourself. I mean, he, he was, his concern was, I have to sell this to a whole bunch of people and they have to like it and this isn't good enough. And he was right. That's a glorious story, Diane. But I have to tell you that my, my co-host, the M5 computer, is signaling me that it's time for the Kobayashi Maru lightning round. Oh, fine. Let's do it. I'll sit up straight. Hold on. Okay, go. The Kobayashi Maru is a challenging and difficult test, cunningly prepared by the M5 Multitronic unit. Should you not only survive the test but pass it as well, the M5 will award you an honorary Star Trek title. Are you ready, Diane? I am ready. M5, load the Kobayashi Maru simulation and prepare to record our guests' responses. Simulation ready. Which warp nacelle is best, port or starboard? Starboard. You've got a bad case of Karelian fever. Are you going to see Dr. Bashir or Dr. Culber? Dr. Bashir. Who's more handsome, Lore or Data? Oh, Lore. Which of these two places will be your next vacation destination, Galorndon Core or Ditalix B? Ditalix B. Who's stealing your stuff? Grubby Ferengi traders or spies? Romulan spies. Oh, Romulan spies. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Simulation complete. M5, please compute the results and tell us if our guest has passed the Kobayashi Maru. Results available. Diane, I am pleased to tell you that the M5 has calculated that you have passed the Kobayashi Maru simulation. Congratulations. Huzzah! And now, the M5, who has analyzed your answers, will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our podcast. M5, what title shall we award our guest? Diane is awarded the title of Writer-in-Residence at the Pennington School. So, congratulations, Diane. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Diane, please tell people how they can uh, follow you or where they can see what you're up to or where they can uh, carry on the conversation with you if they're so interested. Right. My, my website is diannecarryauthor.com. Diane, thank you so much for being part of Trek Profiles. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really been fun. Here ends this installment of the Trek Profiles podcast. And before we offer a Trek quote to close the episode, I'd like to remind you that you may send us your letters of appreciation, your snarky feedback, or selfie videos of yourself yelling, Con! to feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Anything you send us may be used in the show or it may be submerged into a vat of programmable matter in the data core. This time, I leave you with a quote from Mr. Spock, who in the episode The Enemy Within said, quote, And what is it that makes one man an exceptional leader? We see here indications that it's his negative side which makes him strong, that his evil side, if you will, properly controlled and disciplined, is vital to his strength. Close quote. Thanks for listening, and live long and prosper. This handcrafted podcast is brought to you by Stars and Sky Media Lab. It's cosmic. Yeah, who who is your favorite character? Uh, my favorite character is James Kirk. All right, Jim Kirk. 
Um, and do you have a second favorite? Well, no, I don't, because I find each character is interesting to write for in his own way. Okay. Um, so I, when, I read, when I'm writing them, I, I concentrate on why that person is interesting and why his perceptions are different from anyone else's. Makes perfect sense. So Scotty is interesting because he sees everything in a very cold, mechanical logical way in a different way from Spock because he's an engineer. All right. I had to, I actually, it's a weird coincidence because as I was looking at your website and doing some work, getting ready for this, I saw that you wrote about Beaumont hospitals and my father worked at Beaumont hospitals, my father-in-law, I should say. Uh, my wife is from Detroit. So uh, he worked in oh. the hospital system. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Uh, I wrote a book for them. They asked me to uh, write a book profiling the whole hospital system. So I did. It took me two years. Wow, that's amazing. Um, okay, yeah, so it's the biggest project I've ever done. I, I my favorite episode, I get, I would have to say, from from a literary analysis point of view, is the Enemy Within, because it splits the. Stop, Sumo! My stupid little son's dog is growling, <laughs> and I should correct that by saying my son's stupid little dog. That's oh growling. no. <laughs> um, uh, because I'm I'm petting him, and when you pet him, he growls. But right. um, cause this, this dog is loco. Uh, he's a little insane Pomeranian that was rescued, and he's I don't know what happened in his previous life, but he's not. Uh, um, we we just got a dog too in September, so I, I know what you're dealing with. Yeah. Well, I hope he's not insane because this one's loony. No, no, he's not. Right. Um, this one, if you're petting him and you're loving on him, he's growling and snapping. He bites me. You know, <laughs> so, but anyway, I'm stuck with him, aren't, aren't I? I'm, I'm in here. <laughs> anyway, no, not not important. Stop doing that to me. Just sit down. Um, where was I? Was I anywhere important? Uh, do you want to also talk about the Kelvin version of Khan in that or no? Uh, the Kelvin version of Khan? Yeah, the, they made, uh, they put him into uh, Star Trek uh, Into Darkness. The movie that came out, what was that, 2011? Oh, you mean the Benedict yeah, he was, version of Khan? Yeah, yeah. He, that, he was, that, that, that did not resonate with me. They weren't true to the character. Okay. It would, it would be like casting somebody as Spock who did not look or act anything like Spock. Right? If you're not going to be true to the character in, in a continuity series like Star Trek, they just wanted to use Benedict Cumberbatch because he was so popular. And he got on there and he did Benedict Cumberbatch. He didn't do Khan. So I think it was miscast. Oh, that's great. Well, then I think we need to honor that. So just tell my listeners, what's the name of your dog? The stupid thing here? Sumo. Yeah. Sumo, S-U-M-O. Okay. Now, the thing about that is he's 10 pounds of me. He is 10 pounds of snarl, aren't you? He's a little rescued Pomeranian who's insane. Delightfully insane? Kind of. He loves me. I, this is the silly thing. He'll hug me and rub on me and growl at the same time. You want to growl for everybody? Uh, I'm going to growl. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. yeah, he's... Uh, I'm into the big dogs. I always liked setters, and uh, my, my, my beautiful dogs were um, uh, a, a flat coat retriever, an Irish setter, and a Gordon setter. And now I have this thing here sitting next to me, which is a great irony. My son decided he wanted to adapt something just to make a home for a dog. So he asked for, he asked somebody for something that was like, kind, of, kind of old and small and needed a home. And I've got this one. So <laughs> when my son's at work, guess, guess where Sumo is? He's right next to me. Well, I think taking in a rescue is a glorious thing. And I know that you've written about that too. So I, I'm sure that you're taking have, great, camp, yeah, my, great care of him. Oh, are you kidding? He looks like royalty, stupid thing. <laughs> um, God, yeah. Uh, his feet didn't never touch the ground. He'd steak. I mean, did you, did you like the steak last night? Uh, and uh, uh, absolutely, I wrote a book called How to Help Stray Pets and Not Get Stuck, which is what people say to me more often. I tell people, well, if you see a dog on the street, help it. Pick it up. See a cat, pick it up. Well, I'm afraid I'll get stuck with it. So the quite a bit of the book is devoted to how you don't get stuck. You pick up an animal, you prepare your house 
so it doesn't wreck your house. And then you you have this pattern. I have a I have a a template of how you find a home, the right home for the little stray animal that you've picked up. Oh, that's glorious. A home little stick next time. So we yeah, will it's, it's great. We will definitely put links to all your books and all your uh, materials uh, in the show notes up at truckprofiles.com if listeners want to check any of that stuff out, and I would encourage them to do that. Did uh, did you happen to watch the remake of the Battlestar Galactica show? I don't know if you'd seen that. Nope. Remake well, of Battlestar Galactica? Yeah, they made a remake of it. Know, I don't even know about it. Yeah, they made a remake of it. Know. Well, this is uh, – it's about 10 years old by now, but uh, it had Edward James with almost – with the cyborgs and all of that, with the uh, with the Cylons, yeah, it's Cylons? it's yeah, no, yeah. I, n- I never saw that. It, it, it's 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 excellent, no, and I would highly recommend it. But anyway, that's not necessary no. to to understand this story. There's this one part of the show where uh, Edward James almost he's the commander of the ship, and there's this part of the episode where throughout the episode you see him working on a model of a sailing ship. Uh-huh. And he's sort of putting it together at his desk and he's sort of doing it to the side while he's carrying on conversations. And it's never addressed directly that he's doing this, you know, but you see him like working on the parts and putting it together. And mm-hmm. uh, what happened was, is that that was actually a museum quality model that the that the production had got that was worth something into six figures. And they put it on the desk. Ship models are Ship models are, are, are enormously expensive. Yeah, this thing – and it was a museum-quality piece. And they they put it in the set for him to pretend to work on. Yeah. And then at one at one point, there's a scene where he gets some very bad news. And so the actor, Eddie James Olmos, in the scene, in the moment, picks up the model and breaks it. <laughs> and he just oh. – destroys it with his hands because as an actor he felt that in the moment and no one told him not to do that no one told him that this oh thing was... no he destroyed the real thing it wasn't a mock-up no he really destroyed like this model that was worth six figures <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh no yeah, that's that, terrible it, it wasn't oh. in the script you know I mean it's in the script that like a bad thing happens that he gets oh, frustrated God, about oh god it makes me cringe oh. and, yeah and he just you know and the actor he's just such a natural actor you know he just had this moment so I would encourage anybody out there if, you're, if you've if you ever watched Battlestar Galactica go back and watch that episode and see Eddie destroy that uh, ship that was all for real <laughs> oh <laughs> was, god I don't know I don't know if I can bear it how awful <laughs> So oh, um, terrible. Now, these things are worth a, they're they're worth a lot because they're just they're they're rare. I mean, you don't often find a model of a of, of ships that often, and they're usually museum quality unless they're made you know by a teenager. No, this was a legit thing. Yeah. Oh my God, that's terrible! What a story. Oh. I I know, I know, but it was all on film, so you can go actually watch it. It all ended up in the episode, so they used it. So at least they didn't lose the oh. <laughs> they didn't lose the production a- aspect of it. <laughs> Oh, boy, it breaks the heart. <laughs> the, I can hear the dog. Yes, I'm scritching him, so of course he's growling at me. <laughs> Aren't I, stupid? Oh, yeah, yeah, all right. I, he growls at me, and then he bites me, and then I stop scritching him, and then he's, he's rubbing on my hand, like, more, 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 you know. This is a nuts dog. I mean, this is an insane dog. Yes, uh, you are. You are crazy. You you could send me a picture of the dog. I'll put that up on the uh, on the website too. Oh, I will. I will. Uh, right, yeah. All right. Shut up. All right. Well, that's a uh, glorious. I'll tell you something that's that's funny. People will occasionally ask me, "What's your favorite Star Trek movie?" Okay. Galaxy Quest. Think about it. 